Recording. Chewing gum. Got to put it in like a dip. Shut up. You don't want that nicotine gum to be slapping, chew, slapping chew, around. Chew, chew, chew. I'll do it all day. Well, nicotine gum is cool. Why don't you sponsor this podcast, you Sweden beautiful franchise, you? What? <laughs> you Sweden beautiful franchise? Did you know franchise? Nicorette's from uh, Sweden? I meant to say company, but oh. it's the franchise. Okay. Hey, did you know this is Sweat Equity Podcast? Yes. We're the I number did. one comedy business podcast in the world. <laughs> On this earth? In this universe? I already did the thing, though. I'm not gonna... Listen to us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon Music, or Amazon Podcasts, whatever it is now. Uh, if you want to help the show out, here's some sponsors that are going to help you out. And away we go. Squarespace, your all-in-one website builder. Do whatever design you need, custom code, all-in-one, e-commerce. Get the link in this episode description. Call Rail. You want to track all the calls on your website? Yes. You want to get all those calls recorded too? Yeah. To keep tabs on the grunts talking on the phone? Yeah. Well, I'll hit up the link in our episode description and you can track all calls. It doesn't have to be on your website. It could be on other entities, your Google My Business, your Yelp, whatever it is. You can get a bunch of phone numbers and track them all. Bigly Sales, a CRM with marketing outreach with email, phone, dialer, and SMS marketing. And I got to tell you, pay as you go, one cent per SMS. That's insane. Go to uh, our link in the episode description. Get that CRM with marketing outreach. And lastly, LinkedIn Premium. You want two months free LinkedIn Premium? Yes. You want to be creeping on Ryan Reynolds? Is he creeping on you? He's creeping on me. Well, you can I see all the views. I'm, list. I'm can, coming for you, Ryan Reynolds. You can see it with the premium. Not in a malicious way, other than getting you off LinkedIn. That's another thing. All right. Two months free. If no one gets that reference, listen to the last episode. Two months free with the episode uh, description. There's a link right in that little in the little text. I got carried away. My bad. I know, but that's okay. Ryan Reynolds drives me nuts. Go back to Canada, dude. Let's get this party started. Hotty toddy. Sweat equity. Listening to the Sweat Equity Podcast. All right, Paul, you good? We're good. <clears throat> yep, solid. Paul Epstein, why don't you uh, give everybody that's listening or watching uh, where to find you on social, where's websites, any calls to action? Absolutely. Paul Epstein Speaks.com is my website. That's the hub of all things. Most active on LinkedIn and Instagram. Instagram is at Paul Epstein Speaks. And while you're on my site, take your very own confidence quiz. Understand your confidence score one to a hundred, and that's where to find everything. Yeah, we uh, we we both took it individually mm -hmm. um, a while back. But before I'll tease that, before we get into the quiz and all things confidence, um, what advice would you give your 13 year old self? Hmm. Before you start to chase external things and listen to other people's advice on what they think you should do, first understand what lights you up, what brings you energy, what makes you feel alive, and then double down on that. So kind of um, a Simon Sinek kind of start with why-ish kind of area, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I'm Basically, yes, we, we would call those values. And this earlier in life, you can put your values in action. Then that's how you can start winning. And the best way to find your values, ask the five people in the world that know you the best to describe you in one word. And then think of how you can bring that word to life and put it in action. You're mm. girthy. <laughs> no, I was going to say the same thing about you, dude. <laughs> um, yeah. How do you leverage that? <laughs> um. Well, I was going to ask what I like that because other people are doing the work for you. Yeah, <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, it's almost more you embarrassing for me. them. <laughs> right. Oh, I hate to say it. But you're yeah, I don't want a feedback card. I don't know. 
but I think part of that's getting over the ickiness, uh, I'm guessing. But I want to ask, when you were younger, were you following things you didn't want to do or kind of rudderless? What, tell us about your, you know, your early years and why, why you would give yourself that advice. Yeah, well, I think if we're being honest, most folks, I would say 95 to 100 percent of folks do live on other people's terms at a certain point. And I don't think that's necessarily a horrible thing in the sense of we're raised typically by parents, not always. But let's say there's a family component. There's teachers in our life. There's friends and they're giving us advice, both good and bad. And so we have all this noise. And when we're younger, we don't know what to listen to versus what to ignore. We don't know what good advice is versus bad advice. So I, like any other human being, was just kind of going with what felt right at the time. But, you know, we lack experience. And so we're going to make a lot of mistakes and fall down a lot. Um, but I'll tell you that, you know, kind of what, what I think we all, like, lose sight of is we, we think so much, right? It's very, like, in this world of head, heart, hands that I talk about a lot. If head is kind of what do you think and heart is what's your truth, like, what are you feeling and then hands are like how you bring it to action. I think we live in a very head heavy world. And I think what's lacking early is we're not really listening to our heart. You know, like a good buddy of mine speaks to schools all the time. He says, when I go to elementary schools, people are like, me, 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 pick me. And they have all this zest and enthusiasm to, and like no shame in terms of what, oh, I'm going to say something stupid or whatever. And then junior high, they kind of get the alligator arms like, hey, like I'm kind of raising my hand and like maybe I want to ask you something, but I don't want to sound dumb in front of my friends. And then high school, they got their arms folded and they're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, so he basically is like, dude, we squeeze the life out of kids, man. And like if we could rediscover like that five year old, that eight year old, we're like, you just didn't care what other people thought. You know, that, that's kind of one of the bigger gaps that I think we all struggle with. Hmm. Yeah. I like we're getting there. What you and I personally, what? we're getting there, getting to not back, lifelong journey, back to baby. the five year old uh, selves. I like to say I <laughs> underthink a lot. <laughs> I don't overthink. I'm a I, chronic underthinker. I'm just an underthinking kind of guy. I can't make a decision because I don't even think about it. Because <laughs> I don't even know what they are. It doesn't even exist half the time. I forget. Um, <laughs> uh, you spent 15 years as a uh, pro sports executive. Uh, we are big uh, sports dorks. Mm. Can you tell us about that, that part of your life? Yeah, so it's 15 years, three NBA teams, then a global agency that was owned by the Yankees and Cowboys owners. So some big brands end up at the NFL league office, broke some Super Bowl revenue records. And then my most recent chapter was my last handful in sports, heading up revenue for the San Francisco 49ers. But the really cool thing is, put aside the trophies and the accolades and a lot of the achievement, because we certainly checked a lot of those boxes. Like, I, I have this, this thing that I talk about called playing offense in defensive environments. So if you're listening to this, defense is a metaphor for any adversity that you face, any hurdle, obstacle, setback, challenge, all the bad stuff that goes on all around you. And in sports, I was in a lot of losing environments. Like, even though I was on the business side, here's a real example. I started the LA Clippers. Woof. I'm a sales guy, woof. entry level, entry, exactly wow. right. Woof, woof. So, ESPN, a year before I start, they say, You're the worst brand in sports. <laughs> then, my second week on the job, the front cover of Sports Illustrated says, Worst franchise in sports history. Yep. Try selling that. Wow. What's the year? And to, what year is this? Oh, that was uh, 2005. So I guess who's on the other side of the hallway? LA, Kobe and Shaq Lakers. winning championships. Right. Yep, Kobe and Shaq you don't winning get championships. Your own town. I lived yeah. in LA from 06 oh, to 2010. Man. I tried. We're we, we're in Tampa. We don't have a team. I tried to be a Clippers fan. I tried it. I That's tried a, it out. We got the Raptors. A for effort. We had the Raptors. I, I'm a Heat fan. I re, I was like, I got to go to my That's mom's cool. roots in Miami, and I went Heat. Yeah. Uh, after trying for like a year with the Clippers, like 06, 07, I just like, God, this is no magic ever. Magic were never in play. I hate the magic. I hate How do you hate the magic? I grew up with Penny and Shaq. And that then, come was, on, we grew up in their cool glory years. Those were you cool remember years. the little Penny doll? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. Penny doll. And Horace yeah. Grant with his uh, sports goggles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I yes. get that. And look, look, uh, I... I like that era, but I hate the city Dennis of Orlando. Dennis Scott, Nick Anderson, come on, man. Orlando's a fake yeah. city. I don't trust it. 
uh, it's uh, built on yes. it's built on dreams, illusions, <laughs> um, and people lump Orlando and Tampa in the same kind of category. It's like no, we're way different areas. Uh, I I think um, um, oh everybody just kind of lumps anyway. in Florida anyway. But okay, Clippers, you're with the Clippers. Maybe the worst. They're definitely getting. They're definitely getting like. The worst franchise in sports. That was kind of ubiquitous. That wasn't like right when Sports no, Illustrated yeah. declares it. It's kind of official. Absolutely, not, you know, competing when, agencies well, saying differently when that when it wasn't so thin that you could fold it in your back pocket, <laughs> fold it in four like you know origami, put it in your back pocket. I haven't held a Sports Illustrated in ten years. Right, that's what I'm saying. But back then, it, it meant something. Right, and. They were the joke. We're Buccaneers fans. We were the joke in football forever. The Buccaneers. Yeah, uh, you know. Um, so tell us, tell us how you kind of turned that into something. Yeah, and actually, it's it's cool that you said you're a Bucks uh, Bucks guy because where certain sports franchises overlap, and this is kind of what fans of bad teams on the field or the court of the ice do. They put the paper bags over the head. They hopefully cut out some eyes and hopefully cut out the mouth so you can breathe. I mean, that's part of it. And, and so at the Clippers, I remember that, that front cover of Sports Illustrated, one of the paper bags on the forehead said, please shoot me. <laughs> and so that's Stark. kind of the environment that right. I was living in. And so the way I describe it is you've got to figure out a way to sell the unsellable. And so when, when folks don't, demand it when the market doesn't want it how do you connect folks to this thing and then then from there after going from 28th in league revenue to second in league revenue then we hop over to the new orleans they were then the hornets now they're the pelicans we almost lost the team to permanent relocation because a lot of folks in the south didn't care about basketball it's totally football driven like football's a religion and so basketball was like all right no one's coming it's not economically viable, so you might lose the team, and we have to save the franchise through this whole I'm in campaign. Then I go to the Sacramento Kings, and if you guys remember the Maloof brothers, yeah. mm-hmm. and this was not the Maloofs in, when they were on top of the world in Vegas and Palms Hotel. This was kind of on that downfall. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I'm heading up sales there, and then... And the smallest market the, in the NBA, mind you, too. Uh, oh, yeah. By far. I mean, it's... Oh, um, by far. It's the scariest, and, one of the scariest cities I've ever been to in the country, really? too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's, got, it's gotten better, but it certainly had its years. And so, yeah, then we go through a labor lockout. And at the time, my job was to champion company culture. But how do you manage morale in a labor lockout when it feels like people's livelihoods are taken away? And then, if I could even top all of those pit stops off, when I get to the Niners, two years into my tenure there... My team and I were facing 70,000 fans in the aftermath of Colin Kaepernick kneeling. Mm. Okay? So you do go through all of these elements of uncontrollable adversity. And that's why when I speak, I say, we all have defensive environments around us. It could be a toxic relationship. It could be a losing sports team. It could be whatever it is. So how do you kind of rise above that? And that's really kind of where I've made my name, whether in the speaking business or beyond. Um, I just feel like I walked through a lot of fires and it was damn difficult in the moment, but now I'm really proud of it. Sounds like you came, they brought you into these franchises to be the Winston Wolf from Pulp Fiction to come in and go, <laughs> uh, um, all right, <laughs> get a pin and a pad out, yeah. <laughs> drive up in an Acura NSX, you know, be there in seven minutes, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, th- those, you just gave like some of the worst yeah, franchises I can't imagine in a their more eras. difficult yeah. Uh, yeah. journey. And woof, I'm, uh, I might have been the black cat, by the way, because a lot of these teams were winning before I got there and they won after I left. Like the Niners are a prime example. They were like three NFC championships, Super Bowl, and then I show up and then uh, and then I left and now we're good again. So anyways, uh, mm-hmm. I, I might have been the problem, but at least we uh, generated a lot of revenue along the way. <laughs> I think there's a lot more variables to, yeah, to you do that. You were in the personnel yeah, department. No doubt. No no doubt. Doubt. How many people know what a clipper is? What is a clipper? It's a yeah, plane. Do you know the backstory of that? San Diego planes? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. The sailboat, right? They, they were once in San Diego. So the clipper sailboat. And so when they moved to LA, they didn't change the name. I mean, LA has got some. The sailboat, Lakers are but... the same thing. That's just right. stupid. Right. The Lakers. Yeah, is... sure. Minneapolis Lake. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh-huh. all, it's up there with Utah Jazz. It's one of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> the most. So you're saying no The jazz less clubs? jazziest state I can think of. <laughs> yeah. The, 
the we'll least put them in Utah. Cool, it'll be hilarious. The least cool big city where they uh, like ten years ago had the the things on on the bottles of liquor to so you couldn't have a heavy hand. You have to have oh. one shot with a oh, liquor God. drink, Jeez. like that that kind of stuff. The unjazziest place I've ever been. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that, that's really interesting that you're coming into these situations with confidence in yourself. Um, you know, I, I wanted to add, we took the quiz. Mm-hmm. We do have one small question that irked us. So Please. I, I took it and I'm pretty sure, I think I took a screenshot of it. I, t- I got okay. an 81, but my email says I got an 80. It, oh. I, I don't remember I remember, there being a difference for me. I don't know. It irked you. I'm different. <laughs> uh, and but I mean, well, we both got emails that said eighty. Actually, now that I think about it, it's curious that you're like, I I swear I got an eighty one, one better than you, but I can't figure it out. I can't find. I didn't say anywhere. better. I just said you know what that's that my is. confidence. You well, have one it's more like, point. No, you know what it is. It's like the SAT course. We give one point for spelling your name right. So that's all I got to say. That's hmm. it. I'll find that mm-hmm. screen grab. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my shit's on autofill. I'm not going to be missing that one. So I, I forget how many questions this quiz is. We love we love these business related mm-hmm. psychology uh, tests or exams or you know, it, uh, we like doing these occasionally. It kind of tells you who you are in a way. Yeah. Can you break down your your head, heart, and hands aspect for the audience? Just give a quick rundown. Absolutely. So when, when you're trying to make decisions with more confidence, because what I really boil down to is like when folks ask me like, Paul, if you could fundamentally master one thing in life, whether you do it, coach it, train it. And I started talking about all these big things like, oh, well, awareness and ownership and intention. And I think all those things are great. And I absolutely consider those the table stakes of winning in life. The problem is most folks don't know what to do with it on Monday morning. Like if I'm just like, hey, go be more aware. Hey, start owning the good and the bad. Hey, have more intention. It sounds great, but now what do I do on Monday morning differently? It's not pragmatic. So, it's not, it's motivational. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, it, yeah, totally. So like I got it down to this lowest common denominator and, and being in the NFL and NBA, you're around a lot of high performers and high achievers. You start to understand what separate the elite from the rest of the pack, whether in the business side or on the sporting side. And I really kind of came up with two things. I said, those that separate and stay and sustain their, por- their performance, they're very decisive and they are completely comfortable with imperfect action. So if life is this game of decisions and actions, and then if you think about it, whether you take action or not is a decision in and of itself. So this lowest common denominator is decisions. And as I poured more into the research under this, And this is kind of a mind blow, guys. So prepare yourself. The average adult makes 35,000 decisions in a day. Today, today, you, me, everyone listening, each of us, 35,000. As an under, Most, as an underthinker, I think mine's closer to 35. I, yeah, I think I missed some. <laughs> Well, some so unanswered a questions lot of them out are, there for me today. A lot of them are innate, I'm guessing. They're, oh, um, 99% are autopilot. Otherwise, like, we don't have the capacity for it. So, yeah, you're, but you're actually, your number is generous in the sense of how many critical decisions do you make a day? Like a handful, maybe, right? Like maybe, like depending. But there are these really big forts in the road. And what happens at forts in the road is we freeze, we get paralyzed, and then we make the worst possible decision, which is indecision. And so what I realized is that to step through these forks in the road with more confidence, that became the calling card. So you asked me about head, heart, hands. If you ask me, Paul, how do you show up at these critical forks in the road with confidence? What is this head, heart, hands thing all about? I I wanted to make it, you used the word pragmatic earlier. I wanted to create a solution, an application tool that was accessible to everybody. I don't care if you're in high school. I don't care if you're a budding entrepreneur. I don't care if you're a senior citizen. It's something that can universally apply. And so the equation is head plus heart equals hands. So head is when you're approaching these actions, these decisions, do I think it's a good idea? Heart is, do I feel it's a good idea? And when you're heading your heart or on board, that's a green light. You absolutely should take 
action every single time. Head and heart are fully ignited. When one of the two is on board, it's a yellow light. You solve for the gap. Then now that you're aware, you stop running reds. No head, no heart. Don't do it or stop doing it. And so that's what the head, heart, hands equation was all about. It was about creating more confidence at these critical forks in the road. And I really think that the biggest gap that a lot of us have is we go, go, go. We do, do, do. Life is so fast. It's so chaotic. It's so stressful. It's so complex. So we use a lot of head. We act with our hands, but we're bypassing our heart. So I wanted to make sure that this was a head and heart, not a head or heart type of solution. And that's why when I measure confidence, part of the quiz is checking your mindset. How strong is your head? Then it checks your heart. How strong is your authenticity? Then it checks your hands. How much are you driving action? So that's really what the quiz is about. Yeah, I would, uh, you know, I think a lot of overthinkers, I always, when people tell me they, they overthink a lot, right? Yeah. By the way, could you give this, can we get this to all girlfriends and wives trying to decide a restaurant out there, this, this whole process, just so they can get better at making a decision. What do you want to eat? Uh, whatever you want. Okay. How about this? I don't want that. And you're like, what the, f- yeah. what are we doing? Oh, that's so uh, yeah. funny. Um, but the, I would say the, it, the head's the analytical side, right? Yep. That should be the logical. Yep. yep. That should be logical, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and heart's more of a gut intuition, I would say. Right? Yeah, more emotional. Yeah, think of head as logic and heart as emotion, generally. I would, yep. s- so I run into people a lot of the time that have, do the logic aspect with bad data, I feel like. Uh, <laughs> not, I'm, the confidence rate is very low. Uh-huh. And uh, the heart, it's a lot of heart. Uh, so coming into this, that's kind of where, my bias was because I feel like a lot of people make gut decisions, which are usually to be indecisive, which is uh, almost like worse than yes or no. And and like you said, make a decision, try to be, I think you're the, the subtext was you're not going to get every one of them right, but get more of them right. It's you're better off addressing that bad choice faster than just not addressing it at all. Yeah, like my friends that don't want to go get an STD test because they don't want to know the results. <laughs> and then, mm. you know, they might have herpes for years. I don't know if that's I don't know. The same. I was, we have to add jokes into this sometimes that they're not all dice. Oh, man. They're not all swishes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you know, but you bring up a couple, well, you brought up a lot of interesting points, but here's the reality. Look, uh, <laughs> I don't think this is an off-on switch. You're either confident or you're not. I, I think this is a dimmer switch. I think you, you go up, you come down, depending on what's happening in life, in business, at work, with your spouse, with whomever. Like, so I think it's a dimmer switch. But the other part you brought up, which is actually the beauty of the equation, I, I don't know a lot of people that are perfectly balanced between logic and emotion. Like, I don't, I don't meet a lot of people that I'm like, oh my gosh, you're the perfect balance of head and heart. No, like me, I'm way heavy on emotion. So what this equation forces me to do, forces, because it's head plus heart equals hands. I'm forced to check in with my head, even though that's not my natural style. And then for the opposite person that's just thinking and thinking, maybe overanalyzing, I'm like, dude, you got to check in with your heart. This is not a head or heart. It's a head plus heart. So that's how, when I've seen a lot of success with people using it, is because it unexposes your blind spots. Yeah, when uh, when you were talking about the equation uh, moments ago, I was thinking this is a, a, a guide to making you think logically. The unanalyzed life is not worth living kind of thing. So, mm. like... If, you, if I don't schedule a couple of minutes at the end of the day, I probably won't think about the day. So you're, it's mm. kind of like that for your equation where it's like, you know, most people are all heart and most people probably identify with that. This gives you kind of a rubric to go, hey, maybe do – maybe write some X's and O's down. See what – you know, is this a positive or negative kind of thing in a logical way? Is that fair to say? Yeah. Like people – they're, they're driving with uh, emotion and you're kind of like, hey, pull over. Let's do some logic here real quick. 
Yeah. And, and here's what the data is telling us when folks use this. Uh, so as much as I'd love to tell you that uh, that life is filled with green lights. I think the goal and why I wrote the book, Better Decisions Faster, which is really where we unveil this head, hard hands equation. The goal of writing the book was now that you're aware of what a green light is, head plus hard equals hands, like head and heart are on board, attract more, seize more, attack more, fill your life with as many green light relationships as you can, get the green light job, build a green light business, like whatever that is, more green. And then the other thing of awareness is now that you're aware, no head, no heart, stop running reds. Stop. Like I, we're giving you an equation to kind of figure it up like one of those, like, Hey, stop doing it. But here's the, the messy middle. 80 plus percent of what the data tells us is most of business and life lie in yellow, either head or heart is on board. And so, but here's kind of the fast pass to the ending of what we should do. I think there's two types of yellow, head on, heart off, and then there's obviously the opposite. My belief is we should treat those very differently. So like think of, we've been talking about relationships, we could like have some fun and and mess around with this one. But let's say like, you know, damn well, you could be with a person and like at one point they were like attractive to you, like you're dating the supermodel and like, so your head is like, oh my gosh, they're hot, right? But your heart is like, this person isn't the one. I know that. This is not a keeper, but it's fun. And so your head keeps kind of like, you stay in it. But you already know the end of that story. And the same is possible for a job. You stick with it for the logical reason, the money, the head is on board, but you hate it. Your boss isn't that. Like whatever, like you can go down whatever path you want to go down. My advice to that is your heart's not going to change. So if you really want to live a life of greens, you got to exit out of whatever that yellow light is at the earliest possible opportunity. It may not be tomorrow. I'm not telling you to leave a job and be bankrupt tomorrow, but I'm saying know that there is an exit strategy and start to build it. The opposite yellow, when your heart is on board, but your head hasn't caught up yet, my advice to that yellow is stay in the fight because it's so hard to get your heart on board for something that when your heart is in, it typically stays in. So you should absolutely try to untangle kind of the cobwebs in the head and like, Maybe there's some self-limiting beliefs or some other stuff, but my advice for heart in, head out is like, you stay in the fight because if your head can catch up, dude, those can be life-changing greens that once were the good yellow. We're in the HOV lane of uh, driving metaphors. I love it. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes you get stuck at the rest stop. I kind of hate you right now. (laughs) I hate that. I only only said that to piss Eric off. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he knew he would do it. That's why I'm a look. That's why I'm a great comedian. Um, oh. I want to. I want to hear about. Uh, man, I had a roommate that couldn't make a decision in college, and it fucking mm. drove me nuts. Yeah. Uh, and then we get fatigue about his indecisiveness. Can you tell us some some stuff about <laughs> this, like overcoming decision fatigue? Like, yeah. Uh, um, there's people that have to make too many day to day, right? Um, yep. I would say the indecisive people are the most taxing around you. What, uh, what are your thoughts on overcoming that? For sure. And, and like I said earlier, I think indecision is the silent killer, right? Like that's the one thing, like you're not, you're not even pulling a trigger, whether it's a good trigger, bad trigger, like you're not pulling any triggers. Like, and, and you, you brought up a couple things and I know you were probably half joking, half not, but when it was like, Hey honey, should we figure out like whether we want to eat McDonald's or Jack in the box tonight? Like, do I recommend the head hard hands equation for like a trivial decision? My response would be use it for any decision that you think is significant. So as an example, McDonald's or Jack, Box, Jack in the Box on a Tuesday night might not be that significant. But let's say you're on some crazy health plan and then you're like, well, where do I order DoorDash from? Because of the bigger health plan, maybe you should think about it in a more serious way because you have this kind of bigger picture thing. But here's my thought about indecision. So, all right. Everyone listening in and all, all three of us on this pod right now, if we audited our past, the decisions we've made in job, career, relationships, health, if you audit it and you show me the quality of your decisions, I'll show you the quality of your life. And nobody pushes back on that. They're like, yup, totally checks. I, I got it, Paul. Like, yes, life is a game of decisions. Check. So then I'm like, well, hold on. So if it's so important, what's your process? How do you make decisions? They're like, uh, 
Nobody has a process. I don't care if they're CEOs. I don't care if they're like super successful entrepreneurs. I know we have a lot of small to medium business owners on this call. Like, I don't care if it's just the everyday Joe and Jane. Nobody has a process. And so when I thought about this, I'm like, if we could create a simple and easy to understand process, which ended up being the head hard hands equation, that's the solution to overcoming indecision. I think what makes us indecisive is, well, all right, like there's high stakes, there's high consequences. I don't want to make the wrong decision. I don't want to piss this person off. I don't want, I don't want to let this person down. And then we freeze. And when we freeze, we get paralyzed. When we paralyze, we're indecisive. So I'm like, look, I'm not promising you you're going to get to the end of the road using the head, heart, hands equation, but I do promise that within a matter of seconds, I'll get you to a green, yellow, or red, and then that's when the work begins. Green and red are fast. When we say better decisions faster, green is like, go, go, go. Red is stop running the reds. Those are instant. The yellows, we're we're going to need some time, but at least now you can identify it as a yellow And now you know how to confidently navigate going forward. So to me, the head, heart, hands equation was the solve for indecision because now you got a process. And I should mention anybody listening, they can go on your site to take the confidence quiz. It's free. Um, Yeah. Unless you're scared. Yeah. Well, (laughs) um, before we we skedaddle, uh, I wanted to ask you, do you have an example in your life? You made this this kind of um, this process, right? For, to help yeah. people make better decisions. Is there something that happened as you're making this process later that you reflected on and go, oh, I'm, it's, this is almost like, you know. Well, like I feel like paradox. it must have been something where you were like, everybody was telling you something, but you deep down were like, no, but I you, feel like it's this way. And then you went with everybody else. And then later down the road, you're like, I was right the whole time. I was saying like, you used your own system without knowing it after a while later down the line, but I like your question. Too. <laughs> no, we'll you find out. <laughs> by the way, brilliant question. Uh, sure. because I would thank say you. whether <laughs> we both say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. So look at any time, whether you're writing a book or whether you're speaking in front of thousands of people or whatever, like obviously you're not winging it, right? Like you got to kind of, they always say you, you wrote, you write the book that you would have needed five to 10 years ago. So I think any mm. thought leader, any mm. author, any speaker, they should be communicating, myself included, things that are stress tested. Like, dude, I'm not telling you I've always made great decisions, but I'm telling you that when I audited my past, I'm like, bro, when your head and heart were on board, like, and whether I use those exact words, but when I thought, think and feel when those things aligned, I always ended up in a good place. And then I start thinking about those painful, bloody red lights that I ran and ran. And that's just a very slow death. Think about a red light relationship, no head, no heart. You're like, man, what am I doing? And the, the, the real fascinating one though, to me was separating the yellows. I didn't ever analyze anything like, is my head on board or is my heart on board? But then when I said, you know, that job that I was somewhat miserable at, like, why did I stay? Huh? Oh, the money. What's money? Well, head. Okay. But my heart was out. And I knew after six months, after the honeymoon period, I was, so I was like, okay, that's a signal. And then I also thought like, what decisions was I struggling to make? And there was a happy ending, right? Like there was a green light at the end. And those were the ones where my heart was in. And like, I, I, this is not going to tee you up for great comedy, but I'll be very vulnerable with your audience. I disagree. You were in it for the head and the happy endings. Uh, I was I know, trying to go I, with Hansy. I said that as soon as I said <laughs> that, I was like, Oh my gosh. Sorry, so I just and, want to and, point out, you're doing a great job setting us up. Thank you. We it's your to, show. We need, like you do you. Uh, we need to look at our, our comedy decisions on the fly. What? Why? why? <laughs> it's too late. Can't undo yes. it. It's hard to transition from happy ending, but I'll do my best. Okay. So, um, (laughs) no, like one of the biggest, uh, darkest yellow lights I ever had was like my first six months of being a dad. I struggled mightily. Like my heart was all in, but my head was like, what just happened in my life? Like just, again, I'm just putting it out there. And I, I include this in my book because I feel like this was kind of the origin story of like, Paul, you have to be able to help people through these yellow lights. So like, if I could simplify it, I wrote the book to attract more greens. I wrote the books to make people aware so they stop running reds. And I wrote the book because navigating the messy middle of yellow is hard. So I want it to be a part of the solution because I've struggled through as many yellow lights as anybody. So that's kind of the, 
you know, you talk about what did I go through? I went through not loving being a dad at the beginning. And now like, I'm like, oh, the Hallmark card finally showed up, but that's not how it was the first six months. And I just realized, oh my gosh, this is a yellow light that I got to fight through. And if I could help people fight through their good yellow lights, man, that's a beautiful life to live. Well, I tell my friends that have kids, you're that first six months, you're a glorified butler. You're an assistant in the house. Oh, so, yeah. you know, that baby's all about mom. So like, oh, yeah. all you can do is do everything else you can. Yeah, we need anything? Yeah. Um, I can't, pr- I, I was like, I wish I could produce milk. I can't do it. Uh, but I'll go get I tried. My- I tried and nothing happened. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a different, <laughs> that's a different hands to The tech, to the tech isn't there yet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. Well, Paul, appreciate you coming on. Um, we'll have to have you back on at some point, but a lot of stuff there and everybody should uh, kind of use that system you have. It's pretty, it's a pretty good system to memorize. Love it. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on and yeah, would love to be back on anytime. So yeah, for everybody out there just listening in, again, I think confidence is kind of the core of it. So paulepsteinspeaks.com, hit that quiz, and there's going to be a lot of cool stuff that's sent your way after. So it's all in the spirit of making better decisions faster. That's it. Thank you, sir. See ya. Thank you.